वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला दिस इज डॉक्टर अबू सलह आई एम एन असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर ऑफ इंग्लिश एट द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश राजा पैरे मोहन कॉलेज अंडर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कलकाटा दिस मॉड्यूल इज पार्ट ऑफ द पेपर इंग्लिश लिटरेचर फिफ्टीन नाइन्टी टू सेवेंटीन नाइन्टी एट दिस मॉड्यूल इज ऑन जॉन ड्राइडिन एंड द कॉन्टेंट राइटर इज मिस्टर सैदुल हक हु इज एन असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर ऑफ इंग्लिश at tehatta government college under university of kalyani so in this module we will be discussing about john dryden his life his career about his literary writings and various other things so let us see about john dryden john dryden was a leading writer of the restoration age in english literature he mastered the art of traversing a variety of literary expression heroic tragedy comedy bhar satire translation and literary criticism dryden interest intersected and negotiated with different political and religious faction of his time his literary career is intersected with his shifting political alliance time and again so we are discussing about john dryden and we see dryden is a very important literary figure and not only a literary figure but also because of his political affiliations too now we'll see about dryden shifting alliances being allied to puritan party dryden wrote his impressive heroic stanzas in 1659 on the death of cromwell the lord protector but he adopted himself with the changing climate of restoration he wrote a stray redux in 1660 to welcome back the monarch followed by the panegyric to his sacred majesty so we can see dryden shifts his alliances very well he, at first he was he wrote something for oliver cromwell and later he welcome restoration again in his later years dryden shifted his religious alliances from anglicism to catholicism the poet who wrote poems like religio laici in 1682 defining the king's religion in anglican terms changed his views when james to a catholic supporter had occupied the throne in 1685 after charles to's death he wrote the hind and the panther in 1687 supporting catholic views For these reasons Dryden was often labeled as psychophanatic opportunist and political propagandist by his critics he was a controversial figure of his time so we see Dryden is quite controversial because he shifts his alliances and also writes various things for different people who are at the ruling position at certain point of time now let us discuss dryden negotiation with his time but beyond all this debacles about his shifting alliances dryden was just negotiating with the several conflicts that politics and history imposed on the writer's function dryden was not a writer segregated from the real politic of the time but very much rooted in the real historical political and religious conflicts of the time he was negotiating with the predicaments history was showing at him so if we see that the reason of dryden shifting alliances we can see that it is because of the socio political condition of the time it was a very turbulent period and due to heavy shifts in political regime dryden also had to look into those things as a writer should always look into what is happening in the society according to corsin dryden public poems are produced on thorny issues of political theological and literary ideology and therefore there is a constant play of dispute dissent and contestation leading to contestation leading to the poetics of concord it is on the literary plane that survival historical and political issues of the time is debated and discussed 
Right in denies extremism and fixity of any kind and became flexible both in his public life as well as in his movement across different genres of literature. He became an exponent of golden mane of art, politics and morality. So this is quite interesting that Dryden not only shifted his political alliances but also his genre. He has written wide varieties of literature. So that is quite interesting too. Now let us look at Dryden's poems or especially his early poems. Dryden's in this phase wrote many poems defending and glorifying Charles II's restoration. He wrote Astra Redux or which is, can be called as the return of justice in 1660 to his and to his sacred majesty a panegyric on the coronation celebrating Charles II's restoration to the tr throne. His Annus Mirabilis the year of wonders which came in 1666 was a defense of the great friar and the great plague against the fatalic nations, notions of divine retribution by exalting England king, navy, royal society and future progresses in epic quatrain. According to Grover, most of Dryden's early poems helped in shaping and disseminating the ideology of court through the use of clear monarchist typology, which represents the monarchist heroic ideal as morally normative, bounteous, stable, restorative, patriarchal and divinely ordained. Grover further argues that Dryden's subject of panegyric revolved around diverse personalities like Cromwell, Charles, Augustus and King David. But the typological framework of using scriptural and classical analogy and a prophetic messianic sort of vision remained constant. This vision was not abstract as such, rather this was rooted in the contemporary and historicity of time. This vision also dismissed sedation, fanaticism and excess of any kind as anarchist threat to political and social stability. So here we have seen after course in what Grover has said about Dryden and his early poems and styles of his writings. Now let us move and discuss Dryden plays. Dryden was made poet laureate in 1668 on the death of Sir William Devenant. In 1670, he was appointed historiographer royal also. During the period between 1668 and 1680, Dryden turned to writing plays. He popularized the restoration genre by heroic tragedy as well as comedies of manners. After a long Puritan ban, one theatre productions, theatre were reopened with restoration of monarchy and drama became popular with aristocracy and populace. So if we see a uh, look at the time, we see there was a civil war and during the Puritan period, the theatre and the drama were closed down in the whole England. But after the restoration of kings, again theatre and plays started and at the same time Dryden took the opportunity and started writing plays. Among his plays, the heroic plays are very much interesting. So let us see now, now let us see Dryden comedies. According to David Deches, Dryden's early comedies were modeled on the Spanish comedies of intrigue, sometimes with serious on melodramatic scenes, in rhyming couplets, in addition to Johnsonian rumors and love disputes and wit combats. Dryden comedies include The Wild Gallant, which was published in 1663, The Rival Ladies, which came in 1664, Secret Love, which came in 1667, and Sir Martin Marwall. So, we are discussing comedies of Dryden, and now we'll look at a particular 
comedy which is called marriage as marriage a la mode marriage a la mode which was published in 1672 is the most durable of his earlier comedies here the plot humorously explores the restoration attitude to morality marriage sex and virtue the play portrays a situation where a's wife is b's mistress and b's fiance is a's mistress but by continuous cunning contrivances everyone turns virtuous at the end through mutual agreement they subscribe to conventional morality dryden also tried hand in the reproduction of shakespeare plays and dramatized a section of milton's paradise lost as which is known as the state of innocence in 1668 appeared an evening love an adaptation of shakespeare the tempest again in 1679 dryden came up with two other reworking of shakespeare plays that is troilus and cressida and oedipus with nathaniel lee dryden's career as a comedy writer was not very fruitful and he himself proclaimed i know i am not so fitted by nature to write comedy reputation in the reputation in them is the last thing in which i shall pretend which is which he told in depends of an essay on dramatic poesy so it is interesting no interesting to know that dryden has reworked on the previous writers works like he has reworked the plays of shakespeare as also he has rewritten the para- some parts of paradise lost now let us move at dryden's heroic plays in his essay on heroic plays which dryden wrote as a preface to the conquest of granada defends heroic play by asserting that an heroic poet is not tied to a bare representation of what is true or exceeding probable but he might let himself lose to a visionary objects and to the representation of such things as depending not on sense and therefore not to be comprehended by knowledge may give him a freer scope for imagination rhymed heroic plays were popularized by dryden the heroic plays banked on exalted heroic figure having a loud and declamatory style sometimes rising to passionate extravaganza these plays employ the bombastic rhetoric of rhymed couplet so we are discussing heroic plays and specially dryden heroic plays dryden's the indian emperor which came in 1665 and the tyrannic love or the royal martyr which came in 1669 also the conquest of granada in last it came in last two parts in 1669 and 1667 and most importantly aurangzeb which came in 1675 exhibit his huge contribution to restoration heroic play in tyrannic love dryden is exclusively theatrical while portraying the last of emperor maximim to the martyrdom of saint catherine almahdi betrothed to buabdulain falls in love with a stranger almanjur but repulses his advance buabdulain is jealous of almanjur but needs his heroic power finally the spaniards invade the moorish kingdom and kill buabdulain It is revealed that Almanjur is of noble Spanish birth and he marries Almahdi. So we are discussing Dryden heroic plays. We have discussed the conquest of Granada and now let us see about Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb is interesting because it it's setting in oriental land like the previous one. An air of exotism runs through the play as well. set in mogal india it displays the love of aurangzeb for indamora a captive queen their love becomes entangled with politics of the court 
द मुगल एम्पर शाहजहान औरंगजेब फादर एंड मोरट अनदर सॉन ऑफ हिज सेकेंड वाइफ नूर महल ऑल्सो स्टार्ट पार्सोइंग इन द मोरा डिस्पाइट दिस औरंगजेब रिमेन्स लॉयल टू हिज फादर एंड हो एन द स्ट्रगल फॉर थ्रोन लेड टू द डेथ्स ऑफ बादर मोरत एंड नूर महल शाहजहान रिवार्ड्स औरंगजेब बाय अबंडनिंग हिज फीलिंग्स फॉर इन द मोरा सो वी हैव डिस्कस्ड औरंगजेब नाउ लेट एस सी द क्वालिटीज ऑफ हिज हीरोइक प्लेज हीरोज ऑफ ड्राइड एंड प्लेज आर पैसोनेट इंटेम्परेट एंड डेयरिंग इंडिविजुअल दे आर ऑलमोस्ट primitivistic if not primitive in nature according to chris they live not by virtue in any conventional sense but by their pride they conformed only to their own most extravagant conceptions of individual power to what corneli and other french writers termed la galore like the cornelian heroes and sought not approval but admiration but dryden takes a slight turn into this kind of conceptualization of the hero and while writing aurangzeb morat gives up his heroic grandeur for the sake of love according to chris this is the first time in all dryden's drama that love and honor constitute a real antithesis and the victory of love in this context spells the end of the heroic play dryden's own dissatisfaction with the extravaganza of the heroic plays made the genre quite limited too let us continue with the discussion on the hero heroic plays and especially dryden heroic plays dryden was satirized by rochester and his heroic style was also mocked in the rehearsal which was which came in 7, 1671 a barbecue play barbecue play by buckingham dryden attempted writing in blank verse first in all for love and then the world well lost which came in 1678 this is a rewriting of shakespeare antony and cleopatra dryden has mellowed down heroic extravaganza by this time everett h emerson harold e davis and ira johnson in their essay intention and achievement in all for love have argued that the theme for of all for love is the conflict of reason and honor with passion in the form of illicit love from the preface it seems that dryden wished to show how antony torn between these two chooses unreasonable passionate love and consequently punished for his denial of reason by the year 1681 dryden turned towards writing his most popular and well known political verses were satires he wrote absalom and achitophel in 1681 adhering to his alliance to the charles ii and a legitimized and settled government he countered the whig plot and excluding charles ii's heir and brother james from succession to the throne on the ground that he was a roman catholic and replacing charles legitimate son the duke of monmouth to assert his claims protest and whig agitation in favor of duke of monmouth was led by the all of shaftesbury and the duke of buckingham so we are discussing dryden political satires and the one which is immensely popular is absalom and achitophel absalom and achitophel has various characters like the duke of monmouth and duke of shaftesbury and how they fight with each other and the, the story progress let us see that dryden capitalized on biblical story of the rebellion of absalom against his father king david and applied to the contemporary events charles to is compared to king david Mouth, one mouth is represented as Absalom, and the evil counselor Achitophel is here Shaftesbury, and Buckingham as Jimri. Dryden appropriates the Old Testament story to establish sacred truth in the whole political event. 
Dryden elevated the poignancy of the satire by bringing parallels between divine and royal personages. We see what Dryden has done in Absalom and Achitophel that he has taken a story from the Old Testament and he has fitted in the Charles II's reign where various characters like Subsbury, Monmouth and other is being presented and then the story continues. In Dryden's hand, a political satire like Absalom and Achitophel banking on the temporal theme of party politics became a poetic and universal piece of art. Moreover, Dryden raised the political satire from its usual plane to the coarseness of the epical grandeur by incorporating the medium of allegory. Dryden writes in, the, in this poem in opposition to flood of pamphlets favoring the Whig side. Political intention is clear when the king's enemies were represented in an unfavorable light and the royal party is sympathetically portrayed. Absalom and Achitophel is sprinkled with mixed traditions, part history and propaganda, part satire, part heroic and part eulogy. So we see Absalom and uh, Achitophel is not only a political writing but also a very important piece of art. So after discussing Absalom and Achitophel, we will see the satires of Dryden. A trail of satires followed over this incident. When Shaftesbury was acquitted from the charge of high treason, the Whig struck a medal to celebrate the victory. This gave Dryden impetus to write his next satire, The Medal, in 1682, which was a savage attack on Shaftesbury. This poem again provoked a spate of counter-attacks which Thomas Sadwell, the medal of John Bayes, was surpassed. Dryden retaliated with his next satire, Macflecno, which came in 1682. So we see with the publication of Absalom and Akpikitophel, there was various counter writing also. And that has produced various important works like Dryden, um, the medal and Macflecno from Dryden. Now we'll discuss Macflecno. Dryden here lampoons his literary rival and arch enemy Thomas Sadwell in a mock heroic manner. This succession of the state is a common theme in both Absalom and Achitophel and Macflecno. But while the monarchy in the first one was the real world of kinship, here it is the monarchy of bad poetry and nonsense literature. Alan Roper locates this use of this analogy between affairs and kingdom of letters and affairs in kingdom of England to a humanistic concept arising in old tradition of the commonwealth of poetic poets and republic of letters. Thus, the vocabulary of politics provide a rich source of metaphor for literary discussion, especially in a period of such political debate. We continue discussing Macflecno. Uh, the aged Richard Macflecno, a Catholic priest, and a dull writer has long ruled the literary empire of absolute nonsense. Seeking a successor, Flecno chooses the perfect heir, the playwright Sadwell. Drawing allusion from classical Christian literary and historical sources, died in Sutter Sadwell image. As Achenius or Jerome's other hope, Sadwell is the hope of the empire of dullness. As Hannibal saw eternal enmity with Rome, similarly Sadwell waged eternal war against wit. While Greek musician Arion was saved by dolphins in the sea with celestial music, Sadwell's monstrous playing of flutes attracted only pure puny fishes. Just as Elijah's mantle falling on Elisa gave him prophetic bliss, so the mantle of Flecno shrouding Sadwell bestowed on him toys the stupidity of Flecno. Whereas Asia ascend to heaven by a whirlwind Flecno's descent produces a subaltern wind implying skeletological humor. So here we see in, uh, in Mac Flecno 
that Dryden has very savagely attacked Matt Fleck, uh, Fleck, um, Thomas Sadwell. And he has compared with various other important things and he has, you know, mocked him in such a way. Every heroic couplet draws a pattern of inflation and deflation to bring out Sadwell's stupidity. Dryden imagines a grotesque coronation ceremony in which Sadwell takes over the charge of kingdom of nonsense. Sadwell holds potent ale instead of ball and on his other hand Fleck knows love kingdom instead of the scepter. While the ball and the scepter might have represented power and authority and while potent ball might have pro procreated, he has in his hand potent LA which causes sleep and produces neither offspring nor literature. Thus, coronation ceremony is shifted to a location known as Grub Street, associated with poor poets and publishers, hack writers, prostitutes, poor actors, and asylums. Instead of Persian carpet, the path to the throne was covered with torn and unsold works of worthless writers, including Sadwell's own works. Dryden here portrays Sadwell as ultimate epitome of bad poetry. Sadwell is the great monarch of thoughtless majesty who never deviates into sense, whose rationality is fogged by foolishness. Dryden makes Sadwell's existence a complete non-entity in this mock heroic satire. Dryden through his satire has created a history of inferior literature and geography of folly. The poem moves from personal attack on Sadwell to a prototype of an absolute dullness and bareness. By associating Sadwell lineage to Norwich and Newcastle, both of which are peripheral parts of England and also ascribing his heredity to Flecno, a poet from Ireland, and finally measuring Sadwell's kingdom till Barbados, a distant uncivilized colonized territory, Dryden is constructing a powerful binary between the center and the periphery, between himself and his point of attack between his high culture and popular culture. So now after discussing Macfleck now, we will see the religious poems of John Dryden. Dryden also wrote two poems with contradictory approach involving theological discussion. In 1682, he wrote Religio Lacy or Layman's Faith, a poem defending king's religion in Anglican terms. The poem favors Christian religion over any belief in deism and emphasizes the primary importance of Bible as a guide to salvation. His another theological poem, The Hind and the Panther, which came in 1687, supports Catholicism under a changed political scenario when Catholic king James II came to throne. Dryden writes The Hind and the Panther in the mode of allegorical beast fable justifying his way into Catholicism. So we are discussing the religious poems of John Dryden. The one is Religio Lacy and the other one the Hind and the Panther. The Hind and the Panther. The milk white Hind symbolizes the Roman church. The Panther is the Anglican church and the other dissenting sects are also in the form of animals. The first part rep uh, presents discursive reflection on the problem faced by the allegorical person. The lion, which is the king, commands the fiercer beast to allow the timid hind to approach the watering place and allegory in the recent declaration of indulgence. And thereafter, the hind's timidity lessens. The second part is a poly uh, polemic dialogue between the hind and the panther representing the views of the two different sects. The part three of the poem, the panther relates the story of solos who were destroyed because they followed the little <coughs> ill counsels of the Martins, the extremes in Roman clergy whose influence on James II Dryden perhaps feared. The hen retorts to that fable and Bujard, Bishop Barnett, which shows the savageness of the extreme Anglican party. Now, after discussing his religious poems, we will see Dryden's lyric uh, poems and as Dryden as a translator. 
Dryden was also a lyric poet and consider, uh, considerable ability. Some of his famous odes include The Pious Memory of Miss Anne Killingrew, The Death of Mr. Henry Parcel, Song for St. Cecilia's Days, Alexander Fees. Some of these lyrical odes were also set to music. With the 1688 revolution, Dryden's poet laureateship ended and he devoted himself primarily on the translation of Juvenal, Horace, Virgil, Plutarch, Ovid and others work. In Salvai, he attempted Lucretius, Theocritus and some small pieces of Horace. So we see Dryden is not only a religious and political writer but also a lyric poet and translator and he has tried to translate various things from ancient classical literature like Greek and Roman one. Uh, now we'll discuss Dryden essay of dramatic poesy. The masterpiece in Dryden Overe of critical prose is the essay of dramatic poesy which came in 1668. It is written as a debate on drama voiced by four speakers Eugenius, Critus, Lycidias and Neander. The four speakers identify as Dryden contemporaries present diverse point of view. The first speakers, critics, Greek uh, for judge or critic, defends the ancients, Eugenius meaning the well-born, defends the superiority of contemporary English drama, Lycidius prefers French drama to English and glorify Elizabethan drama to that of the early restoration period, and Neander, the new man. The, the most nearly is Dryden himself defends the English as opposed to the French and the, defends the use of rhyme in plays. For Dryden, rhyme is more natural and effective than blank verse in serious plays, where the subjects and characters are great. The essay was occasioned by a public dispute with Sir Robert, Robert Howard over the use of rhyme in drama. This essay is also a critical intervention in the debate between the claims of the ancient authority and exigencies of the modern writer. As Lycidias defines a play, a just and lively imagine, uh, image of human nature representing its passions and humors and changes of fortune to which it is subject for the delight and instruction of mankind. This is a clear deviance from the classical model as Aristotle said, nothing about passions and humors and there is no point of delighting the audience. So we are continuing discussing on the essay on dramatic poesy by Dryden. While defending the excellence of English drama over the French drama Neander or the Dryden himself comments that the play should be lively imitation of nature. But the French drama's aesthetics lies in the beauties of a statue but not of a man because not animated, animated with the soul of poesy which is imitation of humor and passions. Dryden also provides a favorable account of English dramatic tradition in the hands of Johnson, Beaumont and Fletcher and Shakespeare. To conclude this module, we can say that Dryden's Literary life is a commentary on his time, a time of class, party, affection. He was scorned by several of his contemporaries. His reply to them was sharp, sharpened and brilliant satires. He changed allegiances again and again, but this function made him skilled to the air, his voice from a different approaches and formed diverse polemics. Dr. Johnson's comment aptly evaluates Dryden's literary contribution, what was said of Rome adorned by Augustus may be applied by an easy metaphor to English poetry embellished by Dryden. Literatim inventum, he found it brick and then he left it marble. Dryden lived through an age when monarchical succession had twice been broken and restored and therefore Dryden's literary output demands a critical engagement with the aesthetics and politics of restoration period in England. So in this module we have discussed about John Dryden, his life, his career and his literary outputs. We have seen how Dryden is very politically conscious and he has written various genres. 
we have seen here uh, he has close affinity to uh, uh, the royals who were ruling at the time also he was a poet laureate we have discussed various uh, works of dryden especially his satires like absalom and achitophel and macflecno and so here we come to end of this module if you want to know more about john dryden you can have a look at the e text in the next tab also you can see the further reading section of this module where there are several books are listed you can read those and possibly have a wider knowledge on john dryden also you can take part in the quiz section of this module and you can see how you are learning the, uh, this module thank you so much